Okay, we're going to begin the program. Um, welcome. Uh, thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, this is our uh, ATARC customary now, post-pandemic, our ATARC Thursday After Lunch IT webinar series. Uh, my name is Tom Suter. I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And today we are going to talk about network modernization in the context of TIC 3.0. Um, I would like to uh, well, welcome all the attendees. Uh, special thanks to Cheryl Dorch, Lux Thandani, and the rest of the Switch Data and Riverbed team. They've been great partners in it, with us on this. And I'm just really excited about this program and uh, it, it should be fantastic. So we're gonna have this afternoon, you're gonna hear from the panelists. We're gonna have some Q and A. We're gonna pop a cold poll question or two and then answer your questions. And if all the panelists can come on live, I'll do a quick introduction. Okay, there he is. Um, we've got with us uh, Sean Connolly, TIC Program Manager, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Hello, Sean. Hey, Tom. Thanks for inviting me here. Yep, yep. It's always good to see, you know, you're a history buff. I kind of get to know you by as many times as you've been on our, our panels. Um, we also have with us Alan Hill um, with a newish title, I guess, Alan, Acting Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Category Management G at GSA. How are you doing today, Alan? Doing great. Great to see you, Tom. Thank you for like that. Looks like you're night. working from home, if I could guess, in Northern Virginia. That's correct. Great, great. great. Um, we also have with us um, Mr. Ronavar, uh, Chief Contingency Operations, Disinformation Systems Agency. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing really good. Thank you very much. Good, good, good. And you don't look like you're in the uh, Fort Meade right now, so you got the I'm, remote. I'm actually um, in Colorado right now on vacation. Um, it's not a good vacation with a death in the family. So I'm out here in Colorado and it's a little bit chilly today. Well, I'm sorry to hear about that. Sorry for your loss on that. Um, and we also have with us uh, Mr. DeVarius Peoples, Chief Information Officer, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Hey, thanks for having today? me. I'm good. Thanks for having me. It looks like you're in your kitchen. You got a little nook there in the kitchen, is it? Or the dining room or? Yeah, at mom's house today for a little bit. <laughs> I like it. She's organized. It's, it look, it's yes, a she is. Great, great set there. I like that. Um, we also have with us Sean Applegate, who's Chief Technology Officer at Switch Data. Hello, Sean. Thanks for having us today. Yep, yep. And are you in Northern Virginia or D.C. area? No, I'm down near Fredericksburg, speaking of history. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it's a great, great uh, historic downtown there. It's uh, recommended to everybody. Uh, good stuff. And we also have with us, uh, is Marlon made it yet? I don't see I'm Marlon. Here. Oh, there you are, Marlon. You're up in, you're up in my, in the square next to me. Sorry about that. Uh, he's the chief technology officer, public sector riverbed. How are you doing today? Very good. Thank you for having me. And where in the world are you today? Uh, Northern Virginia. So. Okay. We've got a little bit of a Nova, Nova crowd today for the most part. Uh, before we dive into it, I, I, this is like, to quote the great Michael Corleone from The Godfather 3, just when I, I thought I was out, they pulled me back. So for me personally, this is a really special panel. I worked in the network business for a long time. I had a company called Concert Technologies, and uh, I worked on a little project called FTS 2000, which was telecommunications to the government. FTS 2001, uh, and then... Uh, uh, networks and then EIS. I, I didn't really work on EIS in particular, but I, I remember on FTS 2000, we installed a lot of 9.6 and 56K, you know, kind of toward the end of FTS 2000 was 56K circuits. We were getting really, uh, really fancy there. And then um, <laughs> it was mostly T1s um, to the sites. You know, we were starting to get some really high speed communications. And that was re really for FTS 2001. It was FTS 2001 was 56K and T1s. And then by, uh, uh, then by networks, it was T1s to all location, which for those of you, it's 1.544 megabits. Uh, but I would say this, I think all the networks were basically the same. We just got bigger pipes. I think with EIS and where we are today, it's a lot different environment. You know. Uh, at the end of, uh, it, for networks, we had the TIC 1.0 policy came in, but I think networks were fairly designed similar. I think we've seen through pandemic, a lot of people are working at, at home that they never did before. There's a, a lot of remote 
uh, workers. There's a lot of remote use cases. Um, we've cloud computing now. We didn't have cloud computing 10 years ago. We were just in the beginning nascent days of that. And then we have mobile. So now we have mobile networks that are much more robust. Uh, they've grown incredibly fast. And now we have unlimited bandwidth. We also have killer applications. We have video. We didn't, we didn't have much video. And now uh, people are communicating with video. So we got a lot more, a lot more challenges. And uh, maybe we can kick things off uh, with you, Sean. You've been the uh, working on the tick, and uh, you know. And now we've gone through pandemic. A lot of agencies have transitioned, and maybe you can tell us where we are and where where we're going with your program and what you see across government. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And just to, to level set. Um, I was back there installing frame relay and I had a couple goldfish named Feckin and Beckin, right? So it's, I hear you on a long time ago, the circuits, but uh, to, to, to where we are now. So let's start off where we start most conversations on tick three with OMB memo, memo 1926. And you read the document and there's three different um, items in there. The tone of it, if you will, it's the, the new strategy where before we had that north south traffic and we're protecting the castle and had the moat and everything there to, to tra shuffle the traffic through. But now, just like you mentioned, with mobility, cloud and everything coming on, we know we need a different strategy. So the memo allows these alternative strategies. Those alternative, strat those alternative architectures are then what we're working on with Allen's team and OMB, USDS and agencies and these use cases. And we'll talk a little about where we are coming out with use cases. And then also what this all means toward visibility, right? That's the third item. So before, one of the reasons we had that castle and moat was because we couldn't scale security to put the visibility out where all those different connections were, like you were just talking about. And now uh, we had that capability, if you will, through different um, CASBs and different security services. And then, of course, the cloud providers themselves gain telemetry in a totally different way, uh, possibly much more native or telemetry, better context of the data. So that really, that's where we are right now is uh, we release we, CISA, released our guidance in July, our core guidance, and we're starting to work to build out these use cases and close collaboration with Allen's team, make sure uh, EIS is there ready to support this toward the agencies. Yeah, I definitely have seen that collaboration, and thank you for that, Sean. And maybe next time, next we'll talk to Alan if we can get your thoughts since you're working on the EIS for the last few years, and you were a consumer back when you were at education. That was EdNet, right? That's correct. Well, the, it, it's, it's evolved, I should say, um, uh, over the years. Uh, so um, talking a little bit about, I, I like to back it up, kind of cause give a starting point, because why TIC3 is so important, and, and it has to do with the way our networks are designed. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through a couple of things of what's happened with COVID. Uh, agencies had to do some changes to their infrastructure in order to support a, a uh, telework workforce. And some agencies were ready. Other agencies had to do some bolt on. For example, they had to add in VPN licenses or increase bandwidth. Uh, in the traditional way of TIC2 is everything kind of goes into this little pipe to get into your data centers or whatever. And, and that can be quite expensive and, and not necessarily agile in terms of today's infrastructure, what's needed to work in a, we are cloud workers, I should say, because we are not sitting in the traditional office and going through the same pipe. We're coming from all locations. And, uh, and so, the, you know, the agencies, you know, they had, to add, for example, here, Zoom is a perfect example of a, of a tool that was net needed in order to collaborate and work together in today's environment that, agencies had to scale up to get, uh, in addition to VPN licenses to get connections into their data centers or cloud centers in order to get to their business applications. Um, so those capabilities have to be built on, bolted on, and, and in this case, with TIC 3.0, it's going to allow a more fluent way of adding in security, or the security that's needed by trying to go through that that centralized pipe. Um, one thing, I'm gonna give you a little news notes on EIS. So we're now about 14, almost $14 billion in task order awards 
uh, for the contract now. Right. And I, I'll say that what's great about it is, is that many of the agencies took this modernization approach to doing things. They moved to acquire and manage services, network as a service types things, add in software defined networking, uh, wide area network, unified communications, even 5G into being built out into their infrastructure. That allowed not only from a aspect of greater capacity and more modern type capabilities, uh, it, there was also the vendors brought in solutions. And I'll have to say that EIS, we had some projected savings slash cost avoidance. It's even greater than what we anticipated from the competition. And the intent of EIS is bringing the entire federal government to, to buy at a, at a bulk rate and the vendors have been responsive to that. We're working with CISA and TIC 3.0. We're gonna incorporate that guidance into the master contract. So now the vendors will be able to come out with using these use cases, these TIC 3.0 type solutions that, that can comply with that uh, guidance so that agencies can certainly create that network infrastructure. The, the, the network architect that's traditional, you have to tear it out and build in a network architecture that is more conducive to today's modern, modernized type requirements and stuff. Um, and I'm gonna kind of give a couple of examples that are recent news or articles. HHS, their savings is approximately about $700 million that they are gonna have through the life of that contract, which is huge. In addition, they have 5G VoIP and things like that. Department of Defense, DOD, DESA has been doing an awesome job. They had 29 task orders awarded. They're averaging around a 45% savings mark, far exceeding what we expected on EIS. So they're, so, and they're just a couple of the news stories that are, that are recent. But uh, TIC 3.0 is going to help move us to where we need to be in terms of securing our network infrastructure for the future. Great, great. <clears throat> Next, uh, let's uh, move over to the Department of Defense and Mr. Ranavar. You don't actually, you have another program that's a companion type of program, JRSS. Can you give it? And as a matter of fact, I was, I was at the Jake on the Friday before pandemic and everything shut down and, I, and the bandwidth was even getting increased the week before pandemic. So it'd be great to hear how you guys got through that and, uh, you know, what you're working with. A lot of your workers are now remote. So, you know, the reality is the job that I have, I'm the chief of mission assurance, and I kind of have to have a good understanding from a service combatant command agency perspective across the full platform of DOD operations, what those requirements are and what they bring to bear. DOD on an average year has a, an increase of about 30 to 35 percent in requirements, meaning we're always continually increasing the amount of capacity and capability to support those user needs in that environment. We support over 15,000 different applications that DOD uses. And, and so that growth pattern that, that, that's been ongoing for the last 15 years was, like you said a few minutes ago, that was one of the things that we were already addressing. Now, pandemic and, and remote working and enabling additional capabilities saw a growth rate that you know, went up quite a bit. I will say our contracting staff met the requirements. Industry was right there. Industry uh, normally has a um, about a 30% build rate on their capacity. So they have pent up the and that they're all so meeting that challenge in that environment was pretty seamless for us from an agency perspective supporting DOD. Meeting the requirements of the agency were a little bit different, different right? So now you've got, you know, a staff of some odd 10,000 people that are now remotely working pretty much full time. But from my perspective, I will tell you, I've seen a greater capacity in information sharing and collaboration based on being able to do things in a collaborative environment all the time. You know, whether it's a uh, video conference, you know, over one of the video systems that DOD has, or whether it's, you know, teleconferencing, you know, so before you'd sometimes schedule a meeting, people would show up, sometimes they wouldn't. Well, now everybody's at home, so you schedule a meeting, everybody's gotta show up, right? So it, it, I've seen cost savings, I've seen an increase in capability, and I've seen an increase in productivity 
Um, I will, I said it, you know, when we had our little pre-session yesterday, one of the things that concerns me is I'm in the business of uh, risk analysis tied to mission. I also have supply chain risk management underneath my portfolio. So those are changing dynamics within the environment that we're in today. And we are seeing companies getting in the market that are going to be doing things in the market we never saw 15, 20 years ago. And all those things have to be taken into account when you're dealing with Equus Network supporting DOD globally, um, like I said, with a host of different applications and services and capabilities. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, next up, we are going to um, hear from Devarius. And I, I just was thinking about this right now, but it's like, you have a unique challenge of just imagine I've got to drop a circuit at a dam. You know, how do you send a technician out to uh, inst install telecommunications at a dam? What's the address for that? I remember those were some big challenges that you, you and you have to face on a day to day basis. Yeah, we, um, it's though that's a part of the, the civil aspect of the mission that the core has, which is one of three. Um, the civil mission, then we have the mill program mission where we're a construction element or agent for the for the DOD. And then we have the uh, the disaster relief where we help fight hurricanes, natural disasters. Uh, COVID-19 is another good example with the Austin Care Facilities. Um, and there are many challenges trying to ensure that mission continues at those distant end locations. Uh, one of the things you'll see is that in those distant end locations, there is limited connectivity in some places, um, which allows us to, or forces us to, to be even more creative with regards to how we establish connectivity to ensure that those levees, locks, and dams work in a way in which it is that they should. Um, and that's a part of the critical infrastructure uh, capability that, that we oversee from an operational and maintenance perspective. Um, so there is a lot of good things going on. I know from a technology standpoint, we have looked at and are exploring uh, various aspects of how 5G um, can, can potentially help us uh, gain better connectivity at some of those distant end locations. I'm still working with the department to do a lot of use cases and those type of things to really inform us on how to better position ourselves and what technical capabilities we need to, uh, to provide at those sites to really enhance how we do business. But definitely learning a, learn a lot. Um, and we found out through remote work and COVID-19 one of the major challenges we've seen is with regards to not so much the technical capability, but the ability to get the people to those locations um, due to the fact that they're so secure um, and not many have access to them. And you have that two-way or two-person integrity uh, type of system. So you try to go uh, have two people go to those locations. So being able to get the right manpower and the right resources at some of those locations have really been a challenge, especially in the operational and maintenance area. Well, I can only imagine that you have to run fiber, you know, as you increase your bandwidth, running fiber to a dam just is not going to be that easy. I think the 5G method is, is, is probably going to be a lot more economical for you guys. Um, very, very interesting. Uh, next, we are going to have uh, Sean Applegate, and uh, Sean is with uh, Swish Data. And it would be great to get some perspectives, what you see across government and even across, you know, the commercial side. If you can bring some of that perspective to this discussion, appreciate it. Yeah, happy to, Tom. Yeah, so at SWISH, we focus on a balance of cybersecurity, performance engineering, and IT modernization, primarily in public sector, but also in the commercial side. And you know, what's really exciting is the opportunity as things move towards cloud and internet's a primary transport option and 5G matures, our federal agencies have a lot of opportunities to save money and also re-architect how they get to the cloud, how they get to their applications, and really put the user experience and security as both first-class citizens. And that's really the challenge we see ahead of us with a lot of our agencies is how do we balance the security requirements and while also delivering better productivity for the workforce, as well as cost savings across the wide area network. And what we've seen in a lot of cases is the security is, is drastically improving and is moving up the stack towards applications and content and data loss prevention. But you have to do that on both devices and physical offices, internet access points, as well as um, the end user context of it. And that means you need lots of telemetry and you need the ability to move very quickly and do that intelligently across the board. So integrating those solutions into consolidated platforms or tightly integrated sets of policies you can manage from the top down becomes really important the larger you become. 
from a network architecture perspective, often what we see is the collaboration between a security team or even a cloud architecture team and the network team is increasing even more. So tearing down those walls between departments and collaborating and being very forward looking and having a very generative culture to work, focus on the mission, the mission being, you know, what do you need to accomplish from information dominance or helping citizen services or um, other functions, maybe it's diplomatic in, in nature. And when you have global workforces, that's a very complex network and you're not gonna have one transport method. You may have a bit of SATCOM, some 5G, some private MPLS, and you might be adopting high bandwidth, low cost internet, which is where we're seeing a lot of the cost savings, but with that becomes a little more risk around security. How do you manage direct to cloud connectivity over the internet? How do you make that easy? How do you trust not just the site, but the user themselves and the application they're using and set that context? So it's not simple, um, but the main thing I, when we step back and look at the organizations that are doing it well, they're collaborating across the network team and their security team and their cloud teams to figure out what's best. How do they do path optimization? So they minimize the latency, which maximizes their productivity and also enforcing the security rules at the same time. And the, the organizations that are collaborating on the requirements and then identifying what do I have investments in today I can leverage and where do I make swaps out and kind of replatforming or adopting new technologies to align those things, but also save costs at the same time is uh, very real. Um, but you need to do things together. You can't do them in silos. So think of that from a programmatic standpoint. Now, thank you for that, Sean. And uh, last but not least, um, Marlon McFay, uh, Chief Technology Officer, Riverbed. And in full disclosure, I used to install Riverbed gear and it, it was like at least 10 years ago. And uh, we installed it for like Hanes in Bangladesh because it was, you know, when, when, when service is a little sketchy, and uh, the, prod the products you had at that time were, were fantastic. In full disclosure, I used to uh, install riverbeds too. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, good segue, actually. Um, you know, if, if you're unfamiliar with Riverbed, the people who are online today, um, you know, to your point, we oftentimes are thought of as the company, the performance company, making applications work better. Um, at Riverbed's come a long way since then, uh, and we do quite a few of the things, but in the context of, uh, and I'll take a step back, but in the context of working with our customers for things like network modernization efforts or TIC 3.0, or, you know, just the greater digital transformation efforts as a whole, we focus on helping them provide themselves the foundational aspects that they need to, to move forward, uh, as well as through, you know, cradle to, you know, to, to, to grave for uh, these, these, these aspects. Um, I think we've all heard the adage that uh, if you don't know where you're going and you don't have a map to get there or you don't know where you are, you're never going to get to where you're going. Um, and really what we find is, is that this is, couldn't be more true in some of these efforts. Uh, in most cases, what we find, especially in the beginning, is that organizations uh, uh, have probably less visibility and less awareness uh, what's going on inside of their environments. One, than they'd like to and probably less than they think they have. <laughs> And I don't mean that as, you know, as a negative, um, and I, this is what we're trying to combat with these types of things. Uh, so it's not a negative toward the teams that manage or maintain them, uh, more as a statement meaning to signify, you know, the absolute immensity and the impossible job put forth to teams to understand, to be able to effectively rationalize their networks, their end users, their applications, when you know the endpoint devices and users are ever growing where's the data located you know data governance security application location data i mean we could just go on and on and on and on right uh running through less friendly networks across constrained networks you know that map if you think about the adage right has become basically a thousand layers deep right uh, each one of them probably obfuscated to some degree from each other right it's constantly changing and even when you think that you have a good path from point A to point B, which is where you want to get to, um, and, and that path seems open, along the way, you end up hitting construction and detours and all of these other things. Um, so what we're asked to do is really focus on enabling the visibility across all of those, the end users, not just the network, across the network through applications and back. Um, so that you have a, not only a good idea of where you are, a true idea, uh, but then be able to understand what the path is forward and be able to react to uh, the, the, the difficulties of getting from point A to point B when everything is in a changing environment. 
Uh, second, we try or what, we're, what we look to do is provide more options, right? Uh, it was said by a couple of other individuals on here. Sean actually probably said it best where uh, he said something or something. And uh, that's what we've seen to our customers are always faced with is this or decision. You know, I can have security or performance. And that's what we're trying to battle here. What we aim to do is to give that flexibility back and the agility back so that you can take those situations and instead of being an or, it's an and, you know. And that's what really Riverbed is, is uh, there to do. Yeah. Um, I'll start off with some questions for, for everybody, nobody in particular, but how has teleworking affected your agency's productivity and collaboration? Um, Mr. Ronovar, I, I would love to hear from you and how DIS has handled it. Cause I'm so used to going in the building and giving up my personal phone. And, and I always forget, I got to write my notes down cause I usually leave them on my iPad. Uh, so how, now that's a big change of culture for, for you all. Um, you, you know, it is, but, but the reality of it is this is the big bandwidth telecommunication service provider for all of DOD. If we can't remote work, nobody can. And I think the agency's handled it extremely well. Like I said, a few minutes ago, you know, we have very productive meetings. Um, our our uh, ops update is done uh, both on a, on a secret network as well as an unclassified network remotely. Um, we're able to manage all expectations from the customer base. I will tell you from my perspective as a leader and a manager and somebody that has to work across the full platform of the whole agency, I've not seen any hiccups. As a matter of fact, I actually see things working a little bit smoother because like I said before, sometimes you might have somebody that you go to their office, they're not there, they schedule a meeting, something else comes up, they don't show up. But when you schedule a video conference call or you schedule a GVS session, they're online. Um, from me, myself personally, when I talk to my staff, we have a, a staff call three times a week. And I have 100% participation. Um, it's a lot easier to work out to jabber and instead of saying, hey, Bob, would you do your time card? Just to send them a jabber and say, hey, your time card is due. And that's just a, you know, a, a quick example. I think we've met the challenge. I think we're actually doing very well. I wouldn't be surprised if over the course of the next year, even if the pandemic gets solved, that this doesn't stay this course. It, it, I think productivity has increased drastically. Yeah, I, I, I think that memo that was very important that came out from the DOD allowing these remote, um, you know, being able to use remote Zoom and, and uh, Teams and, and all those, uh, I think that was, that was pretty impactful. Thank you for that. Uh, Alan, uh, you guys have always been remote, uh, but what's changed? I mean, you still would get together and you still have, you know, the team meetings and, and, and that kind of thing, but uh, how has it changed over at 1800F? Besides there's um, nobody in the building. Well, I, I can say from a personal perspective, um, I, I found out what gunner glasses are uh, with blue light um, because of you seeing so much color <laughs> when you're doing video conferences. And so uh, I, I wear those every once in a while. Um, but uh, the productivity, I, I'd say one is that um, because we're in the, we were in the center of what was going on supporting agencies, i.e. I, U.S. Army Corps, uh, help them uh, during the pandemic and supporting them. Uh, we were went from a fast pace to a faster pace because of of COVID, and um, I can't say it slowed down either, because it used to be. And I think it might have been Fred that would mention earlier about you would usually have those pauses in between meetings, or you might miss a meeting. At one, you, there's no excuse, but two, we are going from one after another. Uh, the tempo has picked up because of EIS. Um, a lot of things going on there. I, I have some other contracts, uh, 2JIT and, and DOS and those things that are rolling out also um, under, under my portfolio. But um, uh, I would say that people are more productive. Um, I do have to go into the building every once in a while into the SCIF. Um, and that social interaction is nice to have in person. Uh, uh, myself and another exec has to go in and things like that. But um, I, I hope that we can get to a normalization to where we're not always behind the um, computer talking. It'd be nice to be able to see you in person, Tom. 
<laughs> and, and <laughs> be able to uh, talk and, and because I think there is importance. So there's a balancing act between being able to be productive uh, and there's that human interaction that I think is also important. I, I think you're right. I don't know how much of ATARC business was conducted because I happen to run into somebody at the halls of 1800F. So you missed some of that. I do agree that, you know, I like the video better than the conference calls uh, just because you kind of got half of me. I, I don't think you had 100% attention for me. The, these video things really force you to pay attention, which is probably a good thing. Uh, yeah. Devarius? Yeah, so the, the Army Corps of Engineers has always been a, a distributed workforce. Um, so we've never been 100% wedded to the, the office space. I think that's one of the things that, you know, has when we say has COVID enhanced what we do, I think COVID has forced us to move even faster with some of the things that we're looking to do. Um, how do we untether the end user completely away from the desktop to allow them not to have to come into the organization um, to, to do their work? So, so we are definitely leveraging a lot of the collaboration tools. I know that CVR, the Commercial Virtual Remote Environment, uh, which has allowed us to leverage teams that the DOD CIO has supported, um, has really enhanced how we collaborate and do, do the things that, in which it is that we need to do. But really just, just doing normal routine things, even at a higher level, um, because again, we've always been a distributed workforce, not so much married to the offices. Since we work in a lot of the local areas, supporting a lot of local districts and divisions at the state and local level. Um, so that, that's kind of how we've been operating. And now we've just accelerated a lot of the things in which it is that we do, um, just continue to do routine things at, at, at a high level. Uh, Devarius, do you think that, like, uh, do you got uh, whatever platform you use, have you seen increased usage? You know, are people kind of even working remotely differently? Or what have you seen in, um, from your side on that? Yeah, yeah, we have. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I would say our VPN before COVID uh, happened, VPN usage was probably at about six to 700. Um, because again, we try to encourage the, the use of, of non-VPN-like capabilities to really allow users to do what they need to do, which enhances like connectivity and those things. Yeah. When COVID happened, um, our VPN usage went up to about almost 30,000 users a day. So, you know, that was uh, almost triple, quadruple the amount of users that actually use the system logging into VPN to do things such as timesheets and, and regular mission type of thing. So it, it has definitely accelerated and enhanced what we do. And we see that there is a true need for a VPN um, as, as users work remote. So it is it's definitely keeping us on our toes from an IT perspective to really do the best it is that we can do as users are working remote because the new now will probably be here to stay. So we just have to be agile as well as flexible to be able to meet those needs. Fantastic. And, and Sean, you work for an agency. I don't know. Every time I was there, it seemed like a lot of people were in the office. But in I, irony is you're working this program for remote workers. Um, how has that dynamic been over at CISA internally? Yeah, so DHS, we're, I'm sorry, CISA, we're a component of DHS, right? So a lot of it comes out of the uh, CIO shop, Karen Evans, of course, and the CISO shop at the HQ level. Um, I'll, I'll flip this around a little bit. Like you said, we've heard from HUD. Uh, state, uh, I think GSA, they're all well over 90% telework. But from the CIS angle, we're also really monitoring what this means to the adversary and how the adversary is looking to take advantage of this, right? So I always go back in um, August, I think it was, uh, in collaboration with the FBI, CISA released a joint advisory uh, talking about how cyber criminals are taking advantage of a, 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 a vishing campaign, V, that's V yep. for voice for vishing campaign. And to be clear, this isn't, the, the, the campaign wasn't attributed to a federal government. I just, it could be public or private in general. I don't wanna say it was a federal agency. But you see how the uh, adversary is now calling people on the phone, right? And the adversary is mimicking the IT department of that company or that organization and trying to get their the users, the employees for that company yep. to log into a fake, a, a VPN site, and then the, the adversary is able to harvest those credentials. And you just start to see that, and you're starting to see also how adversaries are creating uh, fake social networking uh, sites, and you're trying to use trust, establish trust with a, an employee to send a, a you know a crafted URL, or the adversaries, of course, scanning different cloud environments. And really, it's just this tone where the the attacks are shifting to where those traditional network uh, security controls 
aren't aren't anymore, right? And so that's one of the things we're trying to do with TIC is to, to expand those capabilities, expand just the aperture of what's possible, if you will, to make sure we're securing as much of the uh, environments as we can. Yeah, it's almost like the training's got to change a little bit. If you never worked remote, you, you're getting some, you might be getting a tech you're not familiar with. No, you're exactly right. Yeah, and there's 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 that training also to your point, the IT help desk, what do they need to look at, right? As we move this new platforms, what do they need to look at? This this is all new for lack of a better term, noise coming at them, right? All this telemetry. What's the signal they need they need to look at, right? And then to your point, to the to the end user at home, what does it look like to them if they're getting fished or if they're somehow getting probed by an adversary? What are those different type of uh, uh, TTPs, if you will, those tactics and procedures that the adversary is using? What are those differences that would be, are now prevalent that may not have been prevalent a year plus ago? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Sean, it, you know, I, I know you're in industry and, and uh, you got robust telecommuting things, but what have you seen across government as well as inside your own company? Yeah, you know, to, to play off Sean's comment about APTs doing targeted campaigns at the security level to compromise users, I would say across industry, we've, be seen, we've seen a lot of threat intelligence come together. And from a responsive standpoint, the community that drives and the ability to respond in real time across the community where you have threat intelligence, where you're collaborating across not just the government, but community in general at a security level has been very, very powerful. And so the ability to find an APT with a certain malware package or a URL that they, we know is blacklisted at one customer and it gets validated by a threat intelligence center and then redistributed automatically into an over the top kind of tick 3.0 framework in the cloud real time, it allows agencies to not have to manually stop that, right? The community can collaborate together. They can block it in minutes after they find the first or second or third occurrence and you're able to respond extremely fast without having to put manual labor for into the response itself. And that's one of the things we've found most powerful with a small business like Swish. We're not huge, we don't have a giant stock, but when we leverage those abilities, we can stand on the shoulders of giants and get that benefit without having to have a giant sock behind us employed by our own company to do that. We just leverage the threat intelligence, it happens in real time. Um, and you'll see that from, from lots of different players out there, but you know, if you can use threat intelligence from many different sources, um, not just to respond, but also to gain the visibility and get the contextual insights into the, your log files that are coming in and which APT they're coming from. And then your SOC team can hunt that down and make very intelligent decisions beyond just finding it, um, but ideally preventing it before it happens is extremely powerful. And those are trends we're seeing across industry, both commercially and, in, and federally that are really powerful, but that's how you would prevent bad people instead of finding them after they've been in your network a week or two or three months in some cases. Great, and uh, Marlon? Uh, yeah, so one thing, um, what we are seeing, uh, uh, you know, non-technological, what we are seeing within industry, and we're actually starting to see with a lot of our government customers are, you know, this idea that, you know, we're not gonna go, you know, completely back to the office, maybe it's a couple of days. Um, and there's, you know, considerable cost savings in that from a facilities perspective, if, you know, we can reduce our facilities footprint I think at one point in time, there was probably um, an incorrect thought, maybe it was um, you know, never spoken of, which was, you know, unless my, my workers or my employees are sitting in the office, um, you know, they're not going to be nearly as productive. And I think COVID has definitely, you know, proven that wrong. One of the things from a security perspective to add on to um, what uh, Sean was saying, you know, Riverbed is a, you know, visibility company. Um, you know, we don't necessarily make a firewall or an IPS, um, but there still is, you know, quite a bit of uh, benefit from just the visibility and the ability to apply uh, anomaly detection and behavioral analytics. With all of our employees now kind of working from home, they're sitting within these networks, uh, you know, that have the Xbox or the Alexis or the Google Home. Uh, in some cases in my house, the thermostat, the washer, the dryer, the refrigerator, you know, <laughs> we just put everything on our networks now. Um, and so the attack surface and the attack vector is, is, is uh, quite appealing to, to, to adversarials. I don't know in, again, not, not work related, but I don't know how many friends I've had to text and say, uh, your Facebook account has been hacked uh, because I got you know, the, the, the message from them with the, the crafted URL. And so 
um, it just become more prevalent. Being able to see within those environments, even though our agencies don't actually own them, uh, but have visibility into them, especially when all these other devices are sitting around, um, uh, that same device is quite advantageous. And that is where we focus as far as uh, you know, visibility for that mobile end user. Right, right. Um, I want to switch over to uh, like, like these newer technologies, SD-WAN. Um, Mr. Ranavar, it'd be great to understand where, where, you, where you guys see the place of uh, software-defined networks in the, uh, in the distant network, and where do you think that'll be taking us over the next few years? You know, the reality is the environment is changing. The technology is changing. Software-defined networks and software-defined wide area networks are going to be a part of this platform both from the service and component perspective, as well as the offerings that we're going to have to be willing to bring to bear. Um, again, it's, it's a mix, right? So DOD, you know, operates in 160 different countries across the globe. Um, we have numerous mission partners that we work with, um, which, you know, is inherent to the business that we're involved in for defending uh, both the nation state and providing world security. Um, the reality of it is we have to have a good mix of this. Some things, and I said we have 15,000 different applications. Some of them will probably never be on a software-defined wide area or local area network, um, but a good portion of them probably will. The baked-in security features, I will tell you, um, with software-defined networks and, and wide area networks are supreme. Uh, and I do think they're going to add a whole level of, of security um, in, in, integrated into this capability. Um, the reality of it is technology is changing. Our adversaries are ever faster moving than we are when it comes to this stuff. And this is everything from nation state to just uh, terrorist organizations. And this, uh, it all has to be part of the mix and how we provide capabilities to the warfighter and to our user community. I know that was kind of a, a sketchy answer, but the reality is it's going to be part of what we do for a living. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if I can go to Alan, uh, you know, I know your team has, has been talking about software-defined networks for a while now, and, and, and how is that going as far as these new EIS contracts, and how is it delivered? So, uh, thank you, Tom. Um, well, first thing is that because of the importance of software-defined wide area network, it's been incorporated in the EIS contract. So, uh, agencies can now go out there and look at the different vendors and what they offer and kind of get apples-to-apples apples com comparison of which each of the solutions are and see actually what those costs are associated with those type of solutions. I, to me, the first thing, I'm gonna date myself back like you did, Tom, and going back to, to the, you know, the T1 circuits even, and, and then we went to MPLS, which MPLS is, so you're talking about 1950s, 60s technology for, for uh, TDM, and you're going to MPLS, which is just late 90s, 2000 technology, where software-defined networking is the modern type technology that needs to be used for us to be able to leverage the types of security infrastructure we need, the security architect we need, I should say, along with leveraging cloud capabilities and even getting out to the edge. Uh, and so SD-WAN kind of starts to build and block of what we need. Um, and in case of like Fred, not all technologies that we have out there in terms of our applications can work on that. So there's a, we're in this bit of a hybrid type approach using, for example, what we use in office automation in the cloud, well, where SD-WAN would make sense to be able to leverage that to get access to that where some of the traditional type technologies are still needed in order for those legacy applications, uh, i.e. VPNs, I consider it still outdated technology in terms of the way the cloud operates and stuff. So. You connect your VPN and get into your data center in order to connect to get what you need to your application. But um, to me, SD WAN uh, being available now on EIS al allows the TIC3 begin building that foundation of how security get can get out to the edge and get to the different uh, different uh, branch offices and things like that, uh, and eventually move to a zero trust architect architecture. And I think that's extremely important. Yep. And uh, how about you, Debaris? What Are you looking at um, SD-WAN and, and the impact that would have on your environment? 
Um, we're looking at all possibilities. Um, SD WAN is just one of them. Um, it is a way to accelerate uh, modernization efforts. Um, so, so with that being said, we are definitely taking a hard look at that. But again, I think one of the things that we are, are taking a hard look at is we use a lot of good technical terms. Um, but the thing is, ensuring that our users or that our technicians really understand how to deploy and implement. Um, so, so what we're looking at in conjunction with a lot of these new technology and capabilities, and again, SD-WAN is just one of them, we're really looking at how to train the professionals to really understand what they're doing or how they can properly use and implement and deploy and understand concepts. Um, because ultimately, without a trained professional, then a lot of these concepts are just another government capability that we've embraced and we've deployed it without fully understanding how to get from point A to point B. So we're really investing in the people aspect, but also understanding that we have to move technology forward. And yes, SD-WAN is, we've looked at it. We believe it can assist us with a lot of our modernization efforts as we move to, to an Equinox type of capability, what we consider to be Meet Me Point, um, working with some of our mission partners as well as as we finalize the last aspects of data center modernization um, to, to meet a lot of the directives and those type of things. So it, it's gonna help us standardize our enterprise, it's gonna help us modernize our enterprise, and we're definitely looking at it, but really understanding how to deploy and what it means is even more important to us. Uh, Sean Connelly, you wanna add anything to that? To the no, I just, on uh, that or? yeah, I'll just piggyback on what Alan said. So a lot of what we've done in TIC3, and this is very close collaboration with Alan's team, is to make sure that the guidance coming out from TIC can support an SD-WAN model for the agencies. Um, and then also on, on top of that, Alan mentioned zero trust and internally on the CISA side. And again, well, when I mentioned TIC, of course, it's close collaboration with OMB, their USDS, their digital service team there, the Federal CISO Council and GSA and others. Um, we are looking at to position a zero trust use case. And so I think the value of that would be, again, uh, one of the tenets of zero trust is the, the, the network is suspect or you abstract away the network, and the software that rides on top of it. So I think a lot of what we're talking about here, you'll see reflected in that, um, that zero trust use case, recognize we've already built some of that into the, the guidance, the core guidance itself. That was my next question is zero trust. So we're gonna to get to that. Uh, sure. Excellent. Uh, Sean and Mar or Marlon, do you have anything to add add to this? Don't leave you guys out. Yeah, the one underlying point I would mention is, is if you're going to do zero trust, you need to understand your applications. And so understanding your user community and profiling them, understanding all of your applications and profiling those will then influence your policy set, but it also helps you put granular zero trust policies in place. That's also going to help you determine from an SD-WAN perspective, how do I do quality of path across different internet or transport links? How do I do quality of service for priority of my applications? And that'll help you understand how you're going to implement that. So you can map your infrastructure that you spend hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, in large agencies at least, your network infrastructure to the mission and make it all that much more application and user centric. And the only other part that I'll add is, is you know, I agree with, some of the things that have been, you know, everything has been said, but um, uh, it reiterate a couple of things, you know, our networks today, I think it was 1990s technology for MPLS, right? Uh, you know, networks today, I think we, we need to understand that, you know, we've been deploying and configuring and maintaining them relatively the same way for decades. Um, we have not gone through a period of, you know, immense innovation, yet we are bolting on and tacking on things that, uh, you know, innovative ideas like moving to the cloud, auto, automation, SaaS, uh, tick 3.0. Oh. And so when we're dealing with something like an application that's that old, we refer to it as legacy. And I don't think that we really want to admit to ourselves that a lot of our networks um, at this point in time, large chunks of them, you know, should be, you know, considered legacy. So what are your options? You know, it's not like you can shut down our whole network and modernize it over, a, you know, a couple month period and then turn it back on. Um, so that's that software defined layer, being able to take your legacy network infrastructure um, as a base and now apply new capability and uh, new visibility, agility, security to that top, on top of that, um, you know, so that you can get true application visibility, a true understanding of performance, all the things that we wanna do so that we can move forward um, uh, and employ all of these other innovative ideas. Again, back to the foundation. Yeah. It reminds me kind of like IPv6. It's like, you can't do that overnight. You know, that's like one of these things, the equipment, there's so many inner parts here that you have to gradually
get updated. It, it's, it's not that easy to do that. Uh, uh, we still have time for a few questions. I, if, if some folks want to start asking them, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. We got the time for a little bit. Uh, I wanted to pull the thread on what Sean introduced about zero trust in the network. And, uh, you know, zero trust is a concept even beyond the network. We're, we're um, Mr. Ronovar, where, where's DISA on, on, on that? I know you're working on it. Where do you see the, the future of zero trust in the Department of Defense? You know, so first of all, you have to develop a security architecture that meets the managed service portfolio that your customer base has a requirement for. And, and we are already doing that, right? So your zero trust architecture is bringing your own capabilities to bear. We're doing that within DO. Um, the meet me point capabilities that the vendors are bringing in, that's part of that zero trust architecture as well. So down to the lowest level, and I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is Cybersecurity Awareness Month within the Department of Defense, you know, and as such, that zero trust brings to bear every capability that we are going to bring to the battle base, which includes your cell phones and which includes your, your, your wireless goggles and even your Internet of Things that we brought up a few minutes ago in your house. You know, you might be on a conference call while it's unclassified. If somebody else is inside that network and they're listening, they can compile enough of your comments and everybody else's to come up with a, this is what DOD is doing. And that is also part of that zero trust architecture as we develop the fine infrastructures to support the mission requirements for our user community, we have to always be thinking to the lowest level. And that's how we are addressing it within DOD. Yep, yep. Um, Devaris, you wanna add some, uh, a little bit of color on that from uh, your perspective in Army Corps of Engineer? Yeah, so, so one of the things, so we begin to operationalize zero trust, the zero trust philosophy or concept now, um, because as you know, it is, is, it is a philosophy that you have to, to employ. So we've been working heavy with, uh, with, with NETCOM on, on, on the zero trust methodology and implementation. Uh, we've been specifically looking at our, our O365 IO5 environment. Um, one aspect of that is the access to a Microsoft Teams. Um, because as you know, in an IO5 environment, it, it's, a, it's a highly uh, sensitive environment. And, and the data inside of that environment is also at a level where, you know, we just try to ensure that we have the right security protocols. So, so with that being said, we want users to be able to access that mission critical data from capabilities such as mobile devices and, and those type of things without having to use the VPN. So right now we have a OWA, which is a capability that we all use inside of the environment and users need that type of access. So we've been working with several mission partners, uh, Microsoft and others, to, to really employ a zero trust methodology inside of that O365 environment, especially since it is a heavy operational capability. Um, and we've also began to deploy the zero trust methodology on our critical infrastructure um, SCADA environments as well. Because as you know, those, the, the, whether it's HVAC or, or you know, whether it's, it's, it's different type of control systems, you have to have some type of security methodology in place to properly secure those things because one bad actor or one bad issue uh, will kind of change the whole context of what security means. So the deny all allowed by exception, or at least have the ability to understand what's going on. Zero Trust has allowed us to be able to look at that and we're going through the various layers, various models and learning how to properly implement a Zero Trust methodology. So we, are, we do have different examples that we're using actively now. Thank you. Um, how about you, Alan? What's your team working on in regards to that? Alan, we don't have your voice for some reason. No, we don't have it. Did you mute your phone? I could, I don't know. We lost you, Alan. I, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get back to you. Um, I was on a webinar once and I, I, I actually ha accidentally had mute for two minutes and I talked for two minutes. So you don't feel anything there. That's the thing that's, we're talking about remote computing every once in a while, something doesn't work exactly right. Uh, how about, uh, how about uh, Sean uh, Applegate or Marlon? Do you guys have anything you want to add to that? Sure. From the, from the zero trust perspective, the, the things that we found you know, trickier are going to be integrating into your ICAM or your privilege access management layers. So getting back to collaborating across the departments, often you're going to need to figure out 
you know, who, who owns those things if you haven't worked with them before and then go in and integrating those things into your architecture. And you're gonna to need to do that for lots of different applications if you wanna granularly. So again, figure out where they're, where they're at, how do you connect to them, your database zero trust access um, versus say uh, your network device remote management versus your webified applications versus your RDP or pin client um, will all be slightly different. And you're gonna to wanna to approach those things um, very intelligently from a application perspective. And also things you're gonna access in the cloud through zero trust might be accessed slightly differently than the applications on-prem. And so working together to architect that takes time, but it also takes a lot of uh, strong prod, prod, project management and also making sure you're collaborating across the teams. You have a realistic schedule as well. Yeah. Alan, you want to try to give it a shot again? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Awesome. There we go. So I, I think it's important to understand that zero trust is not a single solution. It's, it's a, it's a, I, I like, uh, uh, the model aspect of it in terms of framing it. And, and it's important to understand that, that this is something you just don't build with just one product. It takes, and, and what, and that Marlin, our, our networks are old. They have to be, you can't necessarily fully jerk them out and replace them, but they have to be modernized. And so that's why it's important to start creating a hybrid network between uh, what we have to what we need to be but uh, it's going to take time to build a true zero trust across the enterprise. And it's not something that's going to be done overnight. And that's why Sean's team focused on what that use case would look like and how it would be done. Uh, and it's got to be done in stages. It can't just be done in one, one fell swoop. Thank you. Um, gosh, what happened to the hour? It's almost gone. Uh, what, <laughs> you guys are too interesting. Uh, Last final thoughts, I want everybody to comment really fairly quickly. When July hits, and I've been very bad at predicting business when this is somewhat over, let's just say summer, things are starting to get back to normal. You are, have the ability to go back in the office. What, are, um, what, are, what is our environment gonna look like and how are we gonna, how are we gonna work in 30 seconds or four? Uh, can I start off with you, Mr. Renovar? What's it gonna be like at DISA in July of next year? You know, the reality is the mission is going to go on. Um, if you, I don't think we're going to change that portfolio where everybody's going to be back in the building. Uh, certainly, there's some things we do at the classified level that we have to be there to do. Um, I will tell you from a growth perspective, uh, the requirements for the department are only going to increase. You know, as new technologies and platforms come to bear, they're going to require more bandwidth, more interconnectivity, more security architecture, more security things inside of there. So from my perspective, we're just going to continue to grow and meet these needs. And there's not going to be a change in dynamics when COVID is over from an interconnectivity perspective. Great. Devarius? Yeah, I believe that it'll, it'll look the same way it looks now. Uh, very distributed, uh, not so much office intensive, uh, but more so remote, which, uh, which will reinforce the need for collaboration tools and, and, and a stronger network. Um, so I think when July gets here, we'll, we will be putting even more funds into strengthening our backend infrastructure to support uh, mission collaboration and mission effectiveness. Thank you. Alan? Uh, I, I believe GSA is going to stay, uh, for the most part, remote. Um, I know we are going to eventually make our way into office, but maybe not in the masses that we've had in the past. Interesting. Uh, Sean, Connolly? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to piggyback a little bit on Alan in terms of, you know, um, from what I understand from DHS side, uh, going forward it, to, to say before July, it's still gonna be um, most of the distributed work, as was mentioned, that, that mission going on. I think one thing you'll is I just try to go back in is you want to spend this all hands on deck sort of healthy. But as we start to move forward, this long-term, how do we survive or how do we move forward with the architecture uh, as this is a primary option going forward? Yep, thank you. And Sean Applegate? Yeah, I would say when COVID starts getting lifted, there's gonna be a sprint across federal to catch up on on-prem physical projects. We're seeing a pretty significant backlog currently. And so just as a federal client base, understand that if your projects have been on hold for a while and everybody wants them to start getting rolling again immediately, there's going to be a lot of contention for labor 
and resources. So the earlier you can lean forward to coordinate with your integrators to do things on prem again, probably the better for your agency. So don't wait until the last minute because I think you're going to be at the end of the line if, uh, if you do. Yeah, I think to that point, we need to, we need more skiff space because those folks have to do their work in the skiff and there's not enough room right, right now with uh, it's, I think that's some of the space could be repurposed to that for sure. Um, Marlon? Um, I, same, I, I, I think the same things that everybody's has basically said on here. I think the one thing that we'll also see um, is, uh, you know, some of our facilities turning more into collaboration spaces and hoteling spaces. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe a, pipe, a partial, you know, uh, you know, a couple of days in, a couple of days out, as it was said earlier on the call, uh, you know, sometimes you just want to be face to face with your teammates while you're working. Um, so we'll have to figure out some way to, to accommodate that. And I think that's what we'll end up doing with the collaboration spaces. Well, the only good thing is I think we solved traffic somehow. You know, we've been arguing about traffic for 50 years in DC area. Somehow I think we figured it out. It's actually kind of nice to drive on the beltway. Um, well, thank you all for your attention. Thanks to the audience. Thank you, Marlon, Sean, Sean, Tavarius, Alan, and uh, Mr. Renovar. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, and thank you uh, to our partners. And next week, we got something special. We're cooking up something special. We, we've got a, a basically a, a, a Power Women uh, podcast on how to sell your digital transformation vision. And it's going to be... Uh, really interesting and uh, we, we've got one of our partners uh, Tracy Robinson going to moderate that one but it should be pretty interesting but anyway thank you for joining us after lunch here and we'll see you next week and everybody have a good weekend